15 Mistakes the Royals Made at Princess Diana's Funeral The tragic death of Princess Diana, Princess of Wales, on August 31, 1997, sent shockwaves around the world as the United Kingdom and millions globally mourned the loss of the beloved princess. The royal family faced immense public scrutiny over their handling of Princess Diana's funeral arrangements and the days immediately following her passing. While navigating such an unprecedented outpouring of grief was undoubtedly difficult, several missteps by the royals garnered criticism at the time. Today's video will uncover 15 mistakes the royals made at Princess Diana's funeral. Number 1. Initial Silence The royal family's initial silence following Princess Diana's death was met with widespread public criticism. People across Britain and around the world expected an immediate and heartfelt response from the monarchy, which took several days to materialize. The days after Princess Diana's tragic passing on August 31, 1997, saw a deafening silence from Buckingham Palace. As the grieving public desperately sought solace and leadership during this painful moment, the void left by the lack of statement or public address from senior royals, like the late Queen Elizabeth, was palpable. This lack of swift communication exacerbated perceptions that the royals were out of touch with the emotional state of the nation and global admiration for the Princess of Wales. Many felt it should have been a priority to issue an empathetic response promptly, acknowledging the tragedy and shared grief. Number 2. Flag Protocol Buckingham Palace was criticized for not immediately flying the Union flag at half-mast, a break from tradition that many saw as a failure to publicly honor Princess Diana's memory adequately. In the hours and days following the news of Princess Diana's passing, critics questioned why the palace flag continued flying at full mast. This defied the standard protocol of lowering flags to half-mast as an official symbolic gesture of mourning and tribute. To the public, it appeared to be a glaring sign of disrespect and a failure by the monarchy to properly honor a member of the royal family. Ultimately, after mounting backlash, the palace flag was lowered two days after Princess Diana's death. However, the damage from this misstep had already been done. Number 3. Public Perception of Insensitivity The royal family's decision to initially remain in Balmoral, Scotland, instead of immediately returning to London was perceived by many as a shocking lack of empathy towards the intensely grieving British public. When the tragic news first broke of the princess's death in Paris, King Charles and his sons, Princes William and Harry, were joining the late Queen Elizabeth for her annual summer holiday at Balmoral Castle in the Scottish Highlands. As images of mourners descending in despair on London flooded the airwaves, the conspicuous absence of the royals from the British capital sparked immediate backlash. To a nation torn apart with heartache, the monarchy's delay in making the nearly 500-mile trip from the remote Scottish estate back to London was seen as an insensitive affront. By choosing to temporarily remain cloistered in Balmoral, they projected an air of being disturbingly detached from the searing national anguish and immense emotional gravity of that moment. Number 4. Media Relations The royal family's handling of the media in the days following Princess Diana's death was seen as clumsy and dysfunctional, contributing to a damaging narrative of insensitivity and aloofness from the monarchy. The news cycle following Princess Diana's passing was operating at an unrelenting pace, with the world's press corps descending on London and demanding constant updates from the royal family. However, the monarchy's media operation proved ill-equipped to handle the heightened press demands and messaging challenges of this singular cultural moment. From a lack of coordinated PR strategy and information flow to uncomfortable hostility between palace officials and journalists, this communications mismanagement projected an administration appearing overwhelmed and unable to properly disseminate appropriate messaging to a rabid worldwide audience desperate for the monarchy's official stance and tributes for the people's princess. Number 5. Public Relations in the days after Princess Diana's shocking death, as the public wailed with sadness, the House of Windsor remained extraordinarily guarded and committed to decorum over emotional transparency. 
This robotic facade and adherence to staid traditions of the monarchy's PR approach backfired tremendously as Britain and billions globally craved raw displays of shared anguish from the royals. With Princess Diana so beloved for her people's princess warmth and emotional candor, the need for relatable human expression from King Charles and other senior royals took on outsized importance and urgency. However, statements read by royal spokespeople yielded to stuffy legalese, failing to capture the inspirational and sentimental connections Princess Diana forged through her audacious royal rule-breaking and boundary-pushing. Number 6. Engagement with the Public In the shocking aftermath of the Paris Tunnel tragedy, impromptu memorials and displays of communal bereavement materialized across the United Kingdom. However, the royal family remained largely esconded behind palace gates and aristocratic estates as average Britons sought emotional solace in gathering en masse. This physical detachment from the public's raw emotions was interpreted by many as the monarchy failing to open its doors wide enough to embrace its grieving subjects. For a nation coping with the incomprehensible loss of its most electrifying female figure since Queen Elizabeth I, the people demanded their symbolic sovereigns be both seen and heard sharing in their sadness. Yet there remained sparse visual evidence of King Charles, his sons, or other senior royals publicly commingling with the floral-toting, tear-stained masses. Each passing day of perceived reclusiveness only intensified scrutiny over the monarchy's apparent unwillingness to emotionally connect on a human level befitting Princess Diana's unrivaled status. Number 7. Funeral Arrangements The contentious debates over Princess Diana's funeral arrangements laid bare long-standing tensions regarding her evolving status and relationship with the royal family. On one side, the palace advocated for more subdued proceedings befitting her divorce status and relinquished titles. However, Princess Diana's own family demanded a spectacular grand celebration, honoring her unparalleled global celebrity as the people's princess. Clashes emerged over minute details like the procession route, which charities would be represented, and whether the young princess should join. These granular disputes amplified the fundamental philosophical divide. Ultimately, compromises allowed the funeral to proceed, but the fraught negotiation symbolized the monarchy's struggle to reconcile Princess Diana's revolutionary redefinition of modern royal relevance with its traditionalist institutionalism. Number 8. Treatment of Princess Diana's Memory For many critics and royal commentators, the royal family still did not go far enough in properly celebrating Princess Diana's singular life and enormous achievements during the funeral itself, instead appearing focused on preserving staid protocols. By most measures, the funeral service at Westminster Abbey achieved unprecedented global scale and public engagement. An estimated 2.5 billion viewers worldwide watched proceedings highlighted by Princess Diana's sons, Prince William and Prince Harry, bravely joining the somber procession behind her coffin. However, some observers argued the ceremony's contents remained too anchored in traditional pomp and circumstance at the expense of prioritizing more personalized tributes commensurate with Princess Diana's colossal humanitarian impacts and cultural transcendence. For many, the funeral represented a missed opportunity for the stuffy British monarchy to tell Princess Diana's truly extraordinary personal story through a modernized lens. Instead, detractors argued an overarching production ethos favored traditional aristocratic tastes and preferences, perhaps aligning with her since-relinquished official titles, but not her colossal real-world impact as the undisputed revolutionary exemplifying social royal reinvention. Number 9. Handling of the Young Princes the royal family's decision to have Prince William and Harry walk behind their mother's coffin during the funeral procession was viewed by many as an undue burden on the young princes. At the respective ages of 15 and 12 years old, when their mother's life was so cataclysmically taken from them, many believed Prince William and Prince Harry should have been protectively shielded from the ceremony's most searing public spotlight. Walking the full procession route behind Princess Diana's casket struck some observers as an almost cruel task to inflict on two adolescent boys grappling with the rawest emotional edges of anguish and parent loss. 
While Buckingham Palace defended the decision as providing the princes a chance to facilitate communal mourning, this argument was rejected by those advocating childhood innocence be preserved to whatever possible degree following such gutting tragedy. Seeing the bereaved young princes tearfully accompanying their deceased mother in such a public fishbowl was seen as a royally tone-deaf overreach courting psychological harm or complicated grieving. Number 10. Communication with Princess Diana's Family In the lead-up to Princess Diana's funeral, numerous reports surfaced of tensions and communication breakdowns between the senior royal family members and Princess Diana's own Spencer relatives over how the late princess's memory should be most appropriately honored during proceedings. Multiple alleged clashes centered on royal family unwillingness to incorporate enough personal testimonies or showcase enough physical tributes highlighting Princess Diana's tireless devotion towards dismantling the monarchy's archaic public personas. Disagreement pervaded over whether enough charitable organizations and causes beloved by the people's princess would be visibly represented. Behind palace gates, frustrations mounted that Spencer demands seemed excessive and neglected institutional imperatives to retain reverent solemnity. Yet Diana's siblings and advisors pushed for a public memorial event better crystallizing her very embodiment of compassionate strength, transcending aristocratic rigidities. Number 11. Public Statements the delay in public statements addressing Princess Diana's death for a full week from senior royals like King Charles and the late Queen Elizabeth contributed to a damaging narrative of the monarchy appearing detached and out of touch with the overwhelming public mood of grief. Even once statements finally surfaced, their impersonal nature and lack of emotional candor compounded a narrative of the monarchy failing to empathetically lead during traumatic times. For millions, this represented an abdication of the sovereign's fundamental duty to spiritually console their subjects through national crises. The royal family's delayed rhetoric projected indifference towards Princess Diana's iconic status and the public's desperate need for perspective and solace from their figureheads. This communications lapse crystallized accusations that the crown remained disconnected from societal evolution Thanks to archaic protocols, ill befitting the new century's demands for emotional transparency from public leadership. Number 12. Acknowledgement of Princess Diana's Global Impact For a figure who had redefined celebrity humanitarianism, transcended national borders through her compassionate outreach, and attained an adamantine standing among the 20th century's most iconographic figures, some observers felt her seismic international imprint was undersold even within the lavish Westminster Abbey setting. Despite thousands of viewers from around the planet descending on London, many argued Princess Diana's stature as a uniquely borderless, planetary champion of innumerable noble causes was not given its full rhetorical due. While traditional Anglican rites and British state ceremonialism dominated proceedings, some desired further integrating Princess Diana's groundbreaking efforts to humanize royalty by drawing the admiring global family inward. Even aspects like the funeral guest list had some questioning if adequate accommodations were made to seat dignitaries, charity principles, and iconic figures representative of Princess Diana's barrier-obliterating life's work. In retrospect, more robust inclusion could have driven home Princess Diana's boundless empathetic spirit while shepherding the monarchy's reputation for remaining culturally relevant and attuned to burgeoning transnational identities. Number 13. Engagement with Princess Diana's Charities Throughout her public life, Princess Diana was deeply involved in various philanthropic endeavors, ranging from raising awareness about landmines and HIV-AIDS to advocating for the homeless and those suffering from mental health issues. Her compassion and genuine desire to make a positive impact on the world endeared her to many. During the funeral proceedings, there was an expectation from some quarters that the royal family would use this global platform to celebrate Princess Diana's remarkable charitable legacy. By highlighting her tireless efforts and the organization she championed, the funeral could have served as a powerful tribute to her humanitarian spirit and a rallying call for others to continue her meaningful work. Some felt that a more explicit acknowledgement and celebration of Princess Diana's charitable achievements would have been a fitting way to honor her memory and inspire future generations to follow in her footsteps. It could have been a poignant reminder of the lasting impact she had on countless lives around the world 
through her compassion and dedication to helping those in need. While the funeral undoubtedly paid respects to Princess Diana's life, some believed that a more prominent focus on her philanthropic endeavors would have been a powerful and inspiring way to commemorate her enduring legacy as a global humanitarian icon. Number 14. Use of Media The royal family's ineffective use of media in the days following Princess Diana's death was seen as inadequate for bridging the colossal information gap between the institution's traditional privacy and the public's urgent appetite for real-time insights into the most newsworthy tragedy of the modern age. While the Dateline realities of near-constant television coverage did represent the monarchy with unprecedented challenges, critics argue their communications apparatus failed to upgrade itself sufficiently for this watershed cultural moment. Retaining customary reliance on filtered statements from spokespeople and intermittent controlled media availability struck many as a remarkably outdated PR strategy starkly contradicting Princess Diana herself. The days between her passing and the eventual funeral were defined by runway global speculation often based on scant official confirmation or privileged background from royal sources. A spreading information vacuum seemingly allowed narratives of institutional indifference and cold detachment to proliferate almost unabated by effective countermeasures. Number 15. Overall Public Relations Strategy in retrospect, commentators widely believe that the royal family erred in adopting what was perceived as an outdated and emotionally tone-deaf public relations strategy to navigate the unprecedented outpouring of global grief surrounding Princess Diana's tragic passing. Long-standing royal customs revolving around strict message discipline, choreographed staging, and emotional restraint all appeared horribly ill-equipped while the world sank into extended paroxysms of sadness over losing its most beloved modern figure. Symbolically stellar pomp fell disastrously flat, mocked by organic public gatherings worldwide, scaling in both intimacy and attendance never before seen by the monarchy. As mourning transcended borders and demographics, the royal family's communications regimen never seemed to pivot from tightly scripted institutional protocols. This allowed continuous replenishment of public impressions that they were irretrievably detached and indifferent custodians of the people's princess-turned-global icon. From failing to properly address the public's outpouring of grief to missing opportunities to highlight Princess Diana's charitable work, it's clear there were missteps in how the event was handled. Do you think was the single biggest mistake or misstep the royals made in the wake of Princess Diana's death? Do you agree with the points we raised? Or did you see the royal family's actions differently? If you could go back in time and advise the royals on how to approach Princess Diana's funeral, what would your top recommendation be? We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. If you found this video interesting or informative, don't forget to leave a like and share it with others who might be interested in this topic. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel for more exciting content like this. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Until next time, Bye!